Roger Romani comes to us from Stanford University, from the Physics Department and from Cobbing Institute. He will be our Stephen Murray Distinguished Lecturer for today. So we welcome you for this special program by the IAM Division. He was an undergraduate from Princeton, PhD from Caltech, postdoc at Berkeley, Institute for Advanced Study, and then he finally went to Stanford. There's some little uh, notes in your uh, Web page, you had some little visits oh, elsewhere, yeah. but it yeah. seems like you've been at Stanford. For a while. <laughs> um, his scientific interests are all on extreme objects, pulsars, black holes, binary supermassive black holes, <coughs> supernovae, pulsar timing and gravity waves, particle acceleration from exotic systems. And I think in keeping with his interest in uh, exotic objects, you can see the title of his talk, Black Widow Pulsars. I think this should be a fabulous talk. You're renowned for your excellent speaking, and we're looking forward to a great talk. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> Thanks for that introduction, and it's uh, certainly an honor to be giving a talk in Steve's honor. I'd rather have Steve here, but you know, uh, it's great to be able to tell you about something exciting in his, in, on his behalf. So um, as you, I give you a title here with a little footnote so you can figure out what the heck I'm talking about, because this may not be an audience that's familiar with these objects. They're unusual. They're exotic. And I have quite a bit to tell you about them. And I hope that I can keep your interest engaged because I'm going to argue that these objects, while they seem to be rare and exotic, actually may be quite important, both for our understanding of the evolution of X-ray binaries, but also for our understanding of some things in basic physics. And I think I'll be able to at least touch on one of those topics, the topics of the equation of state and the mass of neutron stars. But the quest for understanding those things takes us through a lot of physics. We have to understand a lot of physics about these objects before we can come to those deep conclusions. And so I need to tell you a little bit about this class. So j before I start, just to make sure I'm on the same page, we're going to be talking about millisecond pulsars, spin-powered pulsars, in close, i.e. really short orbital period, binary systems. And the particular distinguishing characteristic of these objects is that the somehow, and exactly how is not yet clear, the pulsar's energy is evaporating the companion star. So when the first of these were discovered some 30 years ago, this was 1915, well, at the time, B1957 plus 20, the original Black Widow Pulsar people were very excited. They thought, they thought this was a really uh, interesting and engaging object. And then there was a real slowdown in our understanding of these systems because there were very few found. Now, I should say there's a caveat to this, that a number were found in globular cluster systems. In the galactic plane, for 30 years, we only, or 25 years, we only had two such objects, two evaporating binary pulsars. But a, quite a large number were found in globular clusters. This all changed when a project that I'm associated with, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, launched and started to survey the sky in high energy gamma rays. We found a very large number of pulsars, a large, surprisingly large number of millisecond pulsars, and an astoundingly large number of the so called Black Widow objects. Now, um, my former student, Mallory Roberts, I think first pointed our attention to that said, hey, look at this. We're finding a whole lot of these evaporating pulsars. This is really unusual. And it turns out, in retrospect, we shouldn't have been surprised. This makes a lot of sense. <laughs> the point is that until Fermi launched, the primary way of finding pulsars was in the radio regime. And it turns out that radio selection effects strongly biases you against finding these black widow pulsars. There are two reasons for this. Well, one is just the fact that you have to search in the radio waves for the accelerated pulsations as it is, accelerates in the binary orbit. So short period binaries are very difficult to solve in the radio. The second thing is that this wind-driven off companion causes all sorts of plasma dispersion effects, retardation, scattering, that make it very difficult indeed to see the pulse signal at all from the pulsars. And so in the radio world, it was extraordinarily difficult to find these. In fact, the only reason they were found in globular clusters is by repeatedly staring at globular clusters. You can occasionally catch episodes where the wind was weak and the pulsar was in the clear, and you could catch it. Fermi changes this because of the penetrating power of the gamma rays means that at least as a DC source, you can see the gamma ray emission from these objects even if they're deeply shrouded in one of these evaporating winds. And so what Fermi did for us is it gave us a finding list, a target list of gamma ray sources that could be studied to find pulsars in them. And deep, repeated radio observations in several cases turned up these black widow pulsars. Quite a large number in the galactic plane, quite a number of them relatively close to us. Instead of being a very, very rare, very, very exotic phase of binary evolution, it seems like this is one of the fundamental things that goes on in close binaries. And so, Understanding those objects is turned out to be a, a very a fun quest in the Fermi world. 
Now, I'm going to draw attention to this diagram here, and it's going to be kind of the key diagram I'm going to use to discuss these objects today, and I'll come back to it repeatedly. It's the log of the orbital period in days here versus the log of the minimum companion mass. Now, um, the orbital period, as you can see, I'm only going to pay attention to the folks that are at one day or less. So all the longer period systems I'm not going to talk about. They have an interesting evolution, but it's really quite different. But in periods of less than a day, things start to get pretty exotic. This minimum companion mass, well, I say that because when you have a pulsar detection, you get, as we'll see later, one mass function. You get the mass that you, of, the, um, of the companion as measured by the Doppler motion of the pulsar. But of course, it's, there's projection effects. And so that's, all you get is the minimum mass, the mass that you would get seen edge on for a certain assumed pulsar mass. And if you look at the range of masses here, you can see they're relatively small. This is log and solar masses. So a tenth of a solar mass, a hundredth of a solar mass. So these are low mass objects. And here is an example of some objects plotted there. Now the first thing you notice is that the upper left of this diagram is not populated, and we can understand why. It turns out, look at these two lines here. This is the, the line that shows the time scale for the objects to merge under gravitational radiation in a Hubble time. So evolution gets really fast over on this side of the diagram. The second thing, this diagonal line, is an approximate line for the, uh, where the optical depth due to free-free scattering in this wind being driven from the companion gets to be large. And so objects to be found at low optical depth tend to be in this side of the diagram. The radio-discovered objects are going to be here. What Fermi does for us, radio selection effects means you could find these, and what Fermi does for us is it actually lets us dig deeper into this hidden zone by looking at the gamma rays which can penetrate this wind. So it extends the radio detection frontier. Now, when people find gamma ray sources and they stare at them with radio telescopes and find pulsars in those directions, you say, great, success, we've solved it. But it turns out that there are a number, as I'm going to draw our attention to next, of objects that resisted such techniques, that were gamma ray sources that smell like pulsars, but you still could not find them with standard radio observations. Those turn out to be even deeper in this relativistic wind, and so the unidentified Fermi sources, the unidentified lat sources, are the most extreme of this population. So that's where this project, for me at least, started. We, uh, Fermi had been launched. We'd been doing our initial sky survey. We had a good number of objects. We'd studied quite a few of them well. And it occurred to me that it was high time for us to really understand what the gamma ray sky puts out. So let's try to get a complete, complete bright sample of gamma ray sources and identify them all. So after a good bit of work, finding lots of AGN counterparts, the vermin of the sky, which I managed to do a lot of surveys to help get rid of, we were able to focus our attention on the more interesting and exotic pulsars. Now, one of the beauties of the Fermi lab is that just by looking at the gamma rays, you can get some idea of what you're looking at. It turns out if you kind of uh, characterize the gamma ray emission alone by its variability and by the curvature of the spectrum, whether it peaks in intermediate GeV kind of energies or it peaks at, or has more power law kind of spectrum, you can subdivide on gamma rays alone the population into two classes. On the highly variable but very power law-like emission, these are the AGN. And the highly peaked but not very variable emission, these tend to be the pulsars. So the project started. And when I did this, the brightest 250, the brightest gamma ray sources, there were half a dozen that were unidentified when we started. Those half a dozen were marked in red here. And you can see why I got excited and interested, because they all seem to lie down in this domain. Now, they look like pulsars. And people, of course, went through intense campaigns to search them for pulsations. You could search directly in the gamma rays. You could search by doing radio observations. All such efforts were unsuccessful. And so they become interesting to find out what are these objects, these unidentified sources that look a lot like pulsars. And these six half dozen objects that were remaining, I think, will turn out to be uh, particularly interesting for our Black Widow story. Here they are on the Fermi gamma ray sky. And uh, you can see that a couple of them are in the plane, but most of them are at intermediate to high latitude. And so I made it one of my quests to kind of follow up these objects and figure out what they were. The quest turns out to be fairly multi-wavelength. I'm going to focus here on the optical, although we were helped along the way, of course, by the radio searches and by some uh, X-ray observations. Now, if you're doing optical work, um, it's going to be most practical to work away from the galactic plane. So we started with the objects at high latitude. And the techniques for finding these things was, of course, to search the air ellipses. Now, I said that Fermi's great at finding these sources, and it is, but it doesn't find them all that well. Remember, the PSF of Fermi, while fantastic by gamma ray standards, is still pretty darn big. And so when you have several arc minutes on the sky to cover, there's a lot of optical sources in that kind of region. So it required uh, some fairly deep, unfortunately, and fairly extended observations to kind of figure out what's going on. The two main techniques, 
Um, first, the first step is always going to be imaging. And when we image these error ellipses, and we need four meter class telescopes to do this, a lot of it was done at WIN and at SOAR, you can look for the counterparts of, of objects that are being heated by some invisible gamma ray producing thing. And so in looking for these sources, we were trying to look for counterparts that on a relatively short period changed their brightness dramatically. And so looking for large color and temperature swings was the first way of finding it. And then once you find such objects to characterize them, to understand them, you have to go do spectroscopy. And it turns out most of these are faint enough it's really an 8 to 10 meter class game. And so we had to go on a lot of, a fair amount of what's done with my colleague Alex Felipenko at Keck. We did some at the HET, and we've done some at Gemini as well. Okay. Of course, the final confirmation that we understand what's going on requires you to circle back to the gamma rays and get a radio and or gamma ray pulse detection. That's been done for a number of these, but not all yet. Let me give you an example of one of them. Oh, it's actually a little video running. Okay, so here's a sequence of frames. This one, these data were taken at WIN, actually, on this particular object. Happens to be next to a ridiculously bright star, and I took some... Uh, some GRI frames and colorize them to make you a little color movie as it's going along. And you can see that this particular object here, which we identified as the counterpart, um, it's varying over a period that's quite short, about five hours, four and a half hours. And it's varying from faint and red to, I don't know if you can see it, when it comes to near maximum, it's relatively bright and blue. There's a few other interesting things about this. Oh, one is, uh, you can see this little doohickey flying along there. It turns out this is right in the ecliptic. And every time I observe it, I've got asteroids coming through all the time. In fact, it's terrible. I was doing photometry with this guy at one point, and right when you're taking a really sensitive U-frame, an asteroid comes right across the object within an arc second. So you always got to be careful. It's, it's definitely in the danger zone as these things go. OK, colors. Colors tell you enough to get you an idea that something's varying and give you an idea of the temperature. You really want to understand it, though, you got to do spectra. And here's a sample of spectra of that particular object just to give you a feeling of what's going on. And I think one of the things that's fun about these objects for an astrophysicist is that they're basically a stellar spectroscopy tutorial. They ramp as you go from one side of the object from really cold, in this case down about M5, up through spectral classes, and at maximum it gets up to about F2. So the spectra just took you through the MK sequence um, nicely over a period of, in this case, uh, two hours and a bit. So you need a big telescope to do it fast enough and you need a big telescope to be sensitive enough to see these relatively faint objects. So back to our diagram. Let's take a look at where those unidentified sources were. Well, it turns out, as of today, we've actually solved of five out of those six. There's only one to go, and I hope this next season we can kill that last one. But four of the six turn out to be short period binaries on this diagram. So here they are. I've circled these four. Um, two of them are up in this domain, and two, most interestingly, are down here, and I'll have quite a bit more to say about these guys in a bit. Now, one object turned out to be because of the Fermi, the, the challenges of Fermi localization. It was right in the galactic plane, and the Fermi localization was pulled off by another source, and so it was outside the air ellipse. It turned out it was a classical, young, energetic gamma ray pulsar that was, you know, well outside the 95% uncertainty region. That was solved. That's done. There's only one left to go. And, but the other four turned out to be really quite interesting. They're binary pulsars, and they're very close to this boundary where it's almost impossible to discover objects. So that's great. I would like to argue now, time for a little bit of botany, or I guess in this case, zoology. I'd like to argue that, that you can classify these objects in an interesting way. And I, I almost hate to propagate this further, but when the original objects were called black widow pulsars because... As you know, in the case of the black widow spider, the, uh, the female devours its companion after their productive interaction. And um, so that, that is, that's what's going on in this case. The low mass star spun up the neutron star, energizing the millisecond pulsar, giving it a new, birth on new lease on life. And then that millisecond pulsar fries the companion and presumably ablates it to little or nothing. Those are the black widows. Now, classical black widows are found to have orbital periods in the 10 hour to that kind of day range, and companion masses of a few hundredths of a solar mass. When my student Mallory started working on these, he noticed the first of a set of objects that have now become named by him to know as redbacks. Now, redbacks are, uh, are related spiders we'll see in a minute. And the difference, physical difference in this case, is the, the masses of the companions are not substellar, but stellar. There are a few tenths to up to maybe 0.5 solar masses. So these are substellar, hundredths of a solar mass. These are tenths of a solar mass. 
I would like to argue that this new class of objects that we found in the Fermi sources represents a third category. I'm going to call these titterins in a minute, and um, I'll, I'll tell you why they're special. Well, first of all, it's kind of obvious that they're as far as you can go. They're both very close to the, the, um, the invisibility line, and they're also extraordinarily short period. This is about this is 90 minute orbital period. This is a 75 minute orbital period. Related to these two new gamma ray discoveries, there's a couple of objects. There's the, uh, an object here which is known, um, which was found to be. It's not a gamma ray source because it's relatively low and low E dot. And then there's another famous object known as the diamond planet. This is a short period, orbital period object with a planetary mass companion going around it. I'm going to call these guys titterins because it turns out we were able to show, or at least for these two objects, that they're unique helium substellar companions. So these names. Uh, as I say, it's kind of unfortunate that this has taken over the field, but it seems to be the way it is. So if you're going to name a new class, you've got to choose another oh. spider. So here we are. The original were the Black Widow. Lactrodectus spiders, and, and they're kind of known by that kind of hourglass marking. In this case, it's ventral. The redbacks, they're an Australian cousin of the black widow, and so they're very similar, you know, big and nasty, but in this case, they have a, a marking on the uh, dorsal side. So what's special about this third class, the things I'm proposing are these new kinds of evaporating pulsars? Well, the companions are extraordinarily low mass, so the mass ratio is extreme. So if you look in the same family of spiders, there's a Third object, these are the titterin spiders, this subfamily here. And if you look at the Wikipedia entry, it says, the male of this species is only 1% the size of the female. And at copulation, the male dies during insertion, remains attached. Um, it's not consumed, but the dead male is afterwards removed from the web, as we'll see that this may be an important little com comparison here. So if we're going to have to do this kind of botany, I hope we have no arachnophobes among us. Um, in, in this case, we're going to keep with the theme. And if we need a name for that third class, we'll call them titterins. OK, so here we go. I've got you this PB mass companion diagram to give you a feeling for where they live. Let's look at the objects specifically themselves. It turns out the spectroscopy really does support the idea that these are different classes of objects. First of all, you already know that the redbacks are more or less normal when you look at their surface emission, normal low mass stellar companions. And they are. The abundances are typically about solar. There's no strong emission lines. Here's one that we observed at Keck going from a G-class spectrum up to an A2 or so here. And the spectra look really quite conventional. That's also roughly true of the classical black widows. Remember, these are substellar objects, hundreds of a solar mass. So of course, you, know, you have much lower log Gs. But otherwise, if you look at the spectrum, they're really fairly normal. There's an, an interesting uh, ex excess of the sodium absorption features, and I don't quite understand that yet. But other than that, the spectra are really quite as you would expect for that color temperature class. Now, in contrast, the titterins are really weird. They're weird in particular in the sense that they have extreme hydrogen depletion. So the bottom trace here is a piece of a Keck spectrum. We took a, a one of these titterin objects, 1311 minus 3430. And the upper spectrum is the most hydrogen poor model atmosphere spectrum I could find. This is a model atmosphere with 10 to the minus fourth hydrogen abundance. And I'd like you to compare the lower spectrum with the upper one. Here, I'll mark the Balmer lines for you to draw your eye. And you'll notice that the bomber lines are essentially absent. So the hydrogen depletion is extreme. These are almost completely hydrogen free. And that's pretty remarkable. That tells you something about their evolution, which those of you who are X-ray binary experts already have probably guessed. But it does tell you that they, that they were born in a slightly different way than the classical black widows. Okay. So I've introduced these classes of objects, and now there's a few open physics questions to kind of think about. Evolution from stellar evolution and physical processes. So the open questions. What is it that's driving this wind off the companions? What, what's doing the work of getting these things to evaporate? Is it, I mean, it's the pulsar, sure. But what is it from the pulsar? Is it high energy particles? Is it radiation? Does it turn out to be the E cross B of the wind? We don't really know. And then evolution. Well, we know that redbacks are relatively massive companions. If you're evaporating those and getting rid of mass, can you drive a redback to a black widow or a titterin? It's a good question. And finally, one of the outstanding problems in millisecond and pulsar physics has been the existence of isolated single millisecond pulsars. When the first millisecond pulsar was discovered, I remember that very well when I was an undergraduate. That was a very exciting period. Um, it was kind of shocking to realize that such an object existed. You already had some inkling that you could imagine recycling a pulsar. 1913 plus 16 told us that you could have mass transfer and bring an orbit, a spin period down and give it a rebirth. But a single object that was a millisecond pulsar, that was shocking. 
these black widows originally seem to be the solution to the problem. Seems quite natural. If you're going to have an evaporation process, you recycle your pulsar and then you fry the companion. There you are, single millisecond pulsar. But if you looked at the original black widow and the other ones found in the galactic plane after that, and tried to calculate the rate of mass loss from them, you found it was too low, that they would not complete the job in the Hubble time. So an interesting open question is whether these objects can complete the evaporation to become planet and onto single millisecond pulsars. For the original Black Widow, very unclear. It turns out these titterins, yes, they're going to make it. Okay. Next, I want to say just a few words about this wind since it's so important and some of the diagnostics we discovered for it. And then if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to spend a little short tutorial on binary evolution processes so you can kind of think about how things move in that PB um, companion mass plane. And then I'll turn a bit on to the physics questions of the objects themselves. Okay, the wind. Um, in keeping with our theme of focusing here on some optical spectroscopy, here are some optical spectroscopy of this fellow, 1311 minus 3430. It's a sequence of spectra. And what's going on? Well, wavelength is going. Here's the blue range coming across here and the red range. And then as you go vertically, what is these series of, uh, these are, uh, these are five-minute spectra, I guess. These series of spectra, um, you can see the object coming and going. So dark is bright in this case. And so as you go from here, it was near binary maximum. The optic was bright. It fades away, brightens up again, fades away, brightens up. We got about three and a half orbits here during this observation period. Now, what's to notice? Well, a couple of things. Let's look particularly over in the blue part of the spectrum. Do you see the kind of a dark S-shaped lines? Those are the absorption features in the, in the secondary, in the surface of the secondary, and that's the Doppler shifting as it goes around the orbit. So that's the Doppler shifting that you can use to get a second mass function and try to measure the masses. But in addition, if you look particularly in the red, you can see that there's some epochs where there's bright emission lines. Now, this guy is pretty rare that it actually shows such emission lines. But you can show that these emission features are actually the material that's ripped off the companion in the form of the wind. And in fact, you can even see such emission lines when the companion, you're looking around the dark side, the back of the companion, you can still see that bright hydrogen in this case, uh, sorry, helium in this case, emission. Okay, so you can go ahead and model this and we do it. And you can show that it's actually, what's going on is you have a, what's called an accretion, excretion spiral. Um, while I'm talking about it, might as well show a little movie since it's been, we generated that at Goddard. It's kind of fun. There we go. So what's going on here is that the pulsar, not, not to speed here, spinning at a period of uh, a couple milliseconds, is giving off gamma ray, as in sort of suggested by the purple, and radio beams. And those gamma ray and radio beams are being, the radio beams are being occluded by this excretion spiral of gas that's being ripped off the companion scar. So the radio beams, shown here in green, are truncated. You cannot see this guy in the radio most of the time but the gamma ray beams punch right through. That's why we're able to target it with Fermi and find the source as a gamma ray source. The material being ripped off the surface of the companion, at least in the initial part of this spiral, is excited to such a state that it can actually be visible in optical emission lines. That's kind of unusual and it's kind of fun. And that was the spectroscopy I was just showing you, studying the motion of the gas that's coming off the companion. Okay. So to continue on, this wind is variable, it's complicated, and I don't think we need to worry about it much more. But you can see here there's visible evidence of material being ripped off the surface of the star and being blasted out into space. And that material that's being blasted out is what occults, in many cases, the pulsar. Okay, so we've got our ingredients. We've got a close period binary, we've got a powerful neutron star, a companion, and in that close period there's a strong interaction between the two. If you wouldn't mind, uh, there's a few equations here, but I would like to just give you a quick reminder of the physical processes that go on in these short period binaries. And I think the key to thinking about this is our, our famous diagram, the log P, log companion mass diagram. I, what I really care about is what the processes do to move things around in this diagram here. First of all, let's start simple. Um, of course, the orbital period is short and it will shrink under loss of gravitational radiation. So that'll take an object and move it kind of horizontally, more or less, in this diagram. Just decrease the orbital period, don't change the companion mass much. Well, if it's out of contact, that's what's going to happen. The object will shrink until it comes into contact. When it comes into Roche low contact and you start to get mass transfer, well, then you're going to move along diagonal lines. Now, those lines, the slope depends on whether the object is degenerate or not, but you can show that the evolution driven by angular momentum loss will take you along diagonal lines in this diagram. There's one more process that we should think about, and that's because we shouldn't forget that this process of accretion is adding mass and angular momentum to the neutron star, and spinning up the flywheel. As you spin up that flywheel, you're storing enormous amounts of energy in that rotating object, and it re-releases that energy later 
in this rotational battery in the form of this pulsar wind that's going to work and evaporate the companion. So the evaporation process, remember, that's going to be decreasing the companion mass, and it's going to move you, I should say, more or less vertical. It depends a little bit on the specific angle of momentum that's being released. It depends on where the wind is escaping the system from. But the motion is more or less vertical in the sense of decreasing the companion mass with only modest change on the orbital period. So that's almost it. There's one more physical thing to think about, and that is, can this pulsar energy be strong enough to hold off the momentum flux of the accretion power? And it turns out there's a couple key conditions that you need to satisfy to do that. For the pulsar wind to break three and make this thing turn from an accretion-powered X-ray binary into a rotation-powered radio and gamma ray source. And it's conditions on the spin-down power of the neutron star. Okay. So back to our diagram. Let's see how these processes work. Well, first of all, remember our diagram's kind of short orbital period here. We're starting at a day and going even shorter. So to even talk about these objects, we must have gone through a common envelope phase. Those of you who work in stellar astrophysics know that common envelope is very important, but very poorly understood. And we will leave it as, we, without too much specific, it'll take some original, widely separated, massive plus low mass stellar companion object and bring it into some short period system. So let's suppose the short period system starts off with an orbital period of eight hours, just for examples here. And in this case, I'm going to have the companion be half a solar mass. This is the kind of evolution that those processes I described would, would take you through. Well, first, you'd have a very short period as a normal neutron star, but it would, be, it would disappear. You'd be out of Roche lobe contact. GR would take you into the Roche lobe contact. You'd have mass transfer, which would spin up the neutron star. It'll break free at this point, and then it'll be a radio pulsar evaporating its companion, decreasing in the diagram like this. Okay? If the companion mass initially is a little bit less, well, it turns out the mass transfer takes longer. You break down, come here, less, less. If it's low enough for a given orbital period, it turns out you will stay in Roche lobe contact for a long time, all the way from down the normal branch and turn onto the degenerate branch, where you're, just a, you're, you're evaporating away the degenerate core of the companion, and you will actually only break free in this region, the so-called Black Widow region. So those physical processes I described are a way of taking the products of common envelope and populating different regions in this diagram. Here's that family for the particular orbital period, eight hours, that I was starting from there. And you can see you get objects that pass through the redback region, black widow region. Not so much down here, but we'll get there in a minute. OK, so what happens when you're doing this mass transfer coming down the companion? Well, a key question is whether or not it can break free, whether the pulsar spin power is strong enough to break free and push that wind away and make the pulsar visible. And it turns out that there are actually two regions where this tends to happen. And interestingly enough, one corresponds to what leads to the redbacks, and the second corresponds to this region that we're calling the Black Widows. Under these conditions, the accretion is usually not strong enough to bury the pulsar. It'll break free and become visible in radio and gamma rays. OK, so what about our third class, those titterins, those guys way down to the lower left? How do you make them? Turns out there are two ways. I think, personally, this simplest scenario is probably the most common. What can happen is if you come into contact with a relatively massive companion, relatively, um, so here's about a solar mass at a modest period, you can actually stay in Roche lobe contact, transferring matter all the way down to here. Now, what's going on is that your companion is relatively massive, and so it's had a chance to evolve. The core has had hydrogen depletion. You have now a helium core. So as you whittle away the envelope in the Black Widow, you're going to eat your way down to a remnant core that's degenerate but conformed of only heavies. And so that's what happens when you turn the corner here in this ultra-compact X-ray binary, comes out during this phase, during the degenerate branch, and eventually breaks free as a titterant object in this region. There are other paths, and I guess you can kind of guesstimate that might be true. Here's a scenario when doing these calculations where it started off as a redback. It actually uh, turns on as a redback evaporates its way through the Black Widow region and comes back here and, and emerges back on the uh, degenerate branch. Here's a crazy one where it actually starts over here, goes into contact, breaks out, becomes a red back for a while. Pulsar spins down too fast. It dies. GR brings it back into contact. It spins up again and then breaks off here. I mean, all sorts of crazy things can happen. But if you look at these evolutions, it turns out you can kind of break them into two classes, the simple class and the crazy class, which can be distinguished by the amount of mass you push across. The simple class turns out to have to take the long road home. You have to come all the way down around the corner. You typically push across a solar mass or so before you break out and start evaporating. 
In other words, a very large fraction of this initial companion star was transferred onto the neutron star by the time you got here. You may not have to always do that. These scenarios only push across a few tenths, but it's a little bit obscure as to how you can wean, wend your way through all these processes to get down to that regime. So in particular, these objects, and possibly also these others, are interesting because they have had large amounts of mass transfer. Let's focus on that, because I did promise some physics, and before I wrap up this talk, I'd like to come back and kind of bear down on this one really, I think, key point. It's key to a lots of areas of astrophysics, and that is the maximum mass of the neutron star. So, I've tried to argue for you that from stellar evolutionary grounds, you would expect these objects to have long, low, m dot mass transfer phases, particularly the Titterans, but to some extent also these other objects too. And the point is that it's, it's slow. It's, this evolution is not fast, and so the accretion rates are, much, are well sub Eddington throughout, throughout this lifetime. You can expect the neutron star to accept a large fraction of that mass. That's in, that's in strong contrast to the bulk of millisecond pulsar binaries, which are found in systems that are typically very wide, which indicates that they have undergone, with a, a white dwarf and a neutron star, that they've undergone nuclear evolution-driven Roche lobe overflow. Under nuclear evolution driving, the timescales are short, 10 to the 8th years or so, and the mass transfer rates are large. The neutron star cannot accept that much mass that quickly, any Tim Luna, crudely speaking, and so you'll end up with an object that has not increased in its mass greatly, a few hundredths to a few tenths of the solar mass. These are quite different. They've gone slowly, and they've spun themselves up extremely far, and so they might be very special. There's a real chance, and in fact, I would argue on evolutionary grounds, there's a real probability that these exotic objects are among the heaviest neutron stars out there. And so the quest now becomes is let's try to measure the masses of these exotic objects and use those to understand the basic equation of state. So here's how I thought it would go when I started on this project a couple years ago. Here was the fond hope. Remember, once you know it's a pulsar, you've got pulsations of the object, and either from radio or gamma ray, that gives you one mass function. You get yourself from the pulsations, you get the size of the orbit, the projected size of the orbit, A sine I, and the orbital period. You plug it in as usual to the mass function, and let's go ahead and solve for the pulsar mass in this expression here. That's the known, the X is the known. What you need to do a complete solution to get the mass are the mass ratio and the inclination I. Now, in the wide binaries that I referred to earlier, the white dwarf neutron star binaries, the classic game is you use post-Newtonian relativistic effects, Shapiro delay, et cetera, to constrain these other parameters. And often, you can, with high precision, measure the mass ratio and the inclination, and you get real measurements for the neutron star masses. This is great. Alas, in the objects I'm referring to here, that plasma being ripped off of the other star really destroys the pulsar timing. Nothing highly accurate can be done because of the dispersion delays and the torques on the system as well. And so that wind prevents you from doing these kind of relativistic companion, uh, measurements, relativistic parameters. Ah, but the energy that's driving the wind heats the companion, and that makes the companion visible. Unlike the white dwarf companions of the, of the, uh, of the classical stars, we have here a relatively well understood, relatively bright companion where you can do spectroscopy, optical spectroscopy, and measure a second mass function. Great. So we're almost there. We get a mass ratio with a second mass function. And even better, if you think about it, when you have a heated companion, of course, the shape of the light curve depends on how you view it. If you view it from the top, the amplitude's small. As you view it from the side, the hot side occults and completely hides. You get very deep orbital modulation. So by measuring the light curves and the spectra, you, imprint, you should be able to solve for the masses and the inclination. And you'd be done, and you prove that neutron star masses are very large, and you say, yo triumphe, and you know, you, you've solved the big problem. However, this is the messy truth, which I discovered when I started trying to do this a few years ago. It turns out, if you think about it, part of it's obvious. The fact that you're heating one side of the star means when you do your spectroscopy, you're measuring the center of light, not what you care about, the center of mass. And the center of light is inside of the center of mass. So your radial velocity amplitude you measure is not as large as the true radial velocity amplitude. You need to do a correction. Well, even worse, that correction appears to the third power because, of course, it goes in as x cubed in the mass function. And finally, that kind of correction means that the pattern of heating that you get on the surface also affects your estimate for sine i. That, too, appears as the cubed power in our expression for the pulsar mass. And what this means, this cubic dependence, means is that you've got to get it right. You've got to get it really right to have high confidence that you've done a good measurement of the mass 
of the companion. You need the, the radial velocity to be very accurately corrected, and you need the inclination to be very accurately modeled. This turns out to be a bit of a challenge. Now, I didn't think so originally, and in practice, we started doing this under this assumption that we could just calculate what the heating was and that we could calculate what the companion would do and solve it all. And there are, in fact, a number of computational codes in the binary world that do this sort of work. Um, those of you who do x-ray binaries know that the heating effect is well known there, and x-ray binaries have been very nicely modeled with these kind of codes. Of course, at lowest level, this is the story. We do see that the pulsar is heating the companion. After all, it's hot on the side that faces the pulsar and cold on the other side. So the basic story is definitely right. But when you apply that basic story with these basic models, here are the results that you get. And i just give you three examples. This, this is one, the, one that really think kicked this business off. Martin von Kirkwick, uh, Rene Berton, and Sri Kulkarni studied the original Black Widow, something I tried to do back in the 90s with the 5 meter, and it just wasn't enough. But the Keck, you could do this. And uh, with Keck, they did a measurement that suggested, with the heating modeling, 2.4 solar masses for the companion. Here's a red back that was recently published by uh, Jules Halpern and his student, 2.45. And here's the, one of those titterins that I talked about, G1311. It comes in informally at 2.68 solar masses. These are dramatic numbers. These are large numbers. And these kind of numbers will affect a wide variety of things happening in compact object physics. Let's just start with the basics. Consider um, type 1A models. When you have double degenerates, you bring in two white dwarfs of near the Chandrasekhar mass. Well, you know, 2 times 1.4 is darn close to 2.7 or even neutron star, neutron star mergers for gamma ray bursts. What if you bring those two in? Will you have a final black hole remnant or you have a remaining beside a neutron star, perhaps rotationally supported for a period? It depends critically on what the maximum mass for neutron stars are. So this is a deep and important question. And if these kind of masses as suggested by these studies over the last few years are true, this is a very important result. I underline the if here because I believe this was important enough that, it was, that we really had to bear down and measure this with high precision. The errors that I quoted for you before were statistical errors, the errors that you got by doing the model fits to the data that you got. But I think an honest assessment of this kind of problem, a problem of this importance, requires you to look at model dependence and systematic errors. And so we undertook that. And what I, we found is that with very high quality photometry and spectra, which we have been able to finally achieve, really because of these Fermi discoveries, there are enough of them that some of these objects are relatively close and relatively bright, a thundering 20th magnitude, that you can actually do some serious work on these objects and measure things with high precision. And what we find is that when we measure those with great precision, this model, while at first blush pretty good, is not adequate. There are serious systematic residuals. In particular, here's a few of the main problems. Um, for example, sometimes the formal luminosity that you seem to, what you calculate is heating up that companion, is larger than the spin-down power of the pulsar, at least when you calculate the fraction that's illuminating the direction of the companion itself. That's a problem. Another problem is that if you're just shining light on the companion, well, it should be shown directly from the pulsar. You expect a symmetric light curve. In contrast, some of them are actually distinctly asymmetric. And finally, when you do these models and do the formal fits, they look pretty good to the eye, but you calculate the chi-squares when the error bars are small, and they are not satisfactory. So here's an example, again, 1311. Let me show you just a diagram from the calculation to give you a deal what, what the issue is. Here's the calculation you get by just direct illumination and heating. And this would be the pattern of heating on the companion from dark to hot on that side. Uh, just to show you another calculation. If you artificially make the front, the nose of the star, the L1 point, cold, so you get this kind of Easter egg shape where it heats up and then you have a cold region in the front, it actually fits the light curve somewhat better and the inclined inclination changes from relatively high to relatively low to relatively high, and the inferred mass drops down to just under two solar masses. So that's a pretty big change from 2.7 all the way down to two. I would argue at this stage, the systematics allow that kind of uncertainty in some of these objects. Another example, I mentioned this guy here that Halpern and company found at 2.45 solar masses. We went off and did detailed spectroscopy and were able to solve for the inclination more accurately, and, and this one dropped to 1.6 solar masses. So whether these objects are interesting or revolutionary is still very much a question. So what's the problem? What's wrong with this picture? Well, I would argue it's something that was actually appreciated really surprisingly early. You look back at this early paper by Stirl Finney and Shree and Roger and some others, um, and I think they appreciated this point quite early on when the first Black Widow was discovered, but it was never really treated carefully or calculated. And that is, it's kind of obvious that if you're going to use a large fraction of the power from the pulsar, 
we're not talking about X-ray photons illuminating it, as you would in an X-ray binary. We're talking about the relativistic pulsar wind. And that pulsar wind, interacting with the companion, does so through a shock, an interbinary shock. I would argue that it's a good chance that one of the solutions to this problem involves treating carefully this interbinary shock. Now, here's one way to think about it. That direct illumination only shown on that part of the object, but the interbinary shock subtends a relatively large solid angle. So the power that's in hitting the shock O in this region, if directed to the star, can bring a lot of power to bear and can actually heat it more from the side in better agreement with the best measurements of the photometry. So reprocessing the pulsar power through an interbinary shock has, I think, the potential to explain what's going on here. So I've been doing some work on this with, um, yeah, I that. Um, yeah, I want to mention, this is one of my uh, undergraduate students who's been working along with me with this. Keep your eye open for him if he applies. Um, he, has, um, he and I have been doing some simulations of this interbinary shock structure. And it turns out, uh, there's a couple of equations here. You don't need to worry about them. There are two dimensionless parameters that pretty much control what's going on. Only two. And that's really good enough. Here's what they are. The first is just the ratio of the power, the momentum flux, really, in the pulsar wind to the power in the companion wind. So if you have mass being lost from the companion at some wind speed, then it can be related to the momentum in the pulsar flux by this dimensionless ratio that we're going to call beta. And when beta is small, when the companion wind is weak, then this bow shock wraps tightly around the companion. When the companion wind is strong, it opens up further. That's one parameter. The second one is the ratio between the wind speed and the orbital speed. So another dimensionless number here. We'll call it V rel. If the wind speed coming off the companion is fast, well, then it's basically two almost relativistic winds hitting each other. You get this nice symmetric shock. But if it's slow, then as the orbital motion lags it out behind, you will distort that shock. So the ratio of the speed to the orbital velocity determines on how distorted the, the uh, bow shock is. OK, so we did some models of this, and it's all really kind of nice. In fact, we can take beta from small values, which are pulsar dominated, to large values, which are companion dominated. One interesting thing is you can calculate the pattern of the relativistic plasma synchrotron emission that you get along the shock surface. Here is the pattern on the sky. This is, um, this is a pulsar minimum, that, so this is superior conjunction. And then it's viewing latitude from north to south. That means that you'll get some x-ray light curves as you cut through different regions of this diagram. In fact, a few of these do have nice x-ray measurements. Here's this object here, a nice x-ray light curve. It, it's a low beta Black Widow system, and it matches pretty well with this regime. Here's a system that appears to be a very powerful red back wind, and that matches well with the orbital phase here. Notice sometimes you have a tight double around um, the optical minimum. Sometimes the tight double is around the 90 degree, uh, 180 out of phase. OK, so in addition to that direct radiation from the bow shock, there's the power that that bow shock shines down on the surface and how it heats the companion. And I don't, this is not the time to go into the details, but just to show you, here's the general shape that you get from heating a companion. And then these are the departures as you vary those two wind parameters. Notice that the differences here, this is typically several magnitudes of variation, and these are only a few hundredths of a magnitude. So they're subtle. But with high-quality photometry, they're important. And they're the key to sort of figuring out what the heating distribution on the surface is. Uh, let's just do one quick application. That's this object that I described to you where we got some very nice Keck spectrum, some very nice photometry. came from Jules Halpern. Here's the uh, data, and BV and R in this case. And there's the model. And that looks pretty darn good to me, doesn't it? Here's the parameters that you fit, and they're all quite reasonable. Ah. Oh, by the way, we, this one happens to have a rather lousy light curve. This is a very short, but it's worth, without fitting it, by just fitting the optical light curve, this is the predicted X-ray light curve that you get. You know, it doesn't disagree. Let's leave it at that. Um, now, look at, those, look at those points here. You don't actually see the error bars. If we blow it up, magnifying the errors quite a bit. Oh, before I leave, I want to note that this kind of work is important because if you think about it, these two dimensionless parameters, the momentum flux in the wind and the velocity of the wind, that tells you the mass flux, right? Because if you got m dot v of the wind and v separately, you got m dot. And with that, you can get the evaporation rate and the time scale. This particular object has a characteristic time of 200 mega years for, for, for having the mass of the companion. Odds are very good this guy will get the job done in a Hubble time. Okay? So this is a very likely an object that will lead eventually to a single millisecond pulsar. But let's get, you know, this is all great, but it's not perfect. And for something of the importance of the mass measurement that I was describing, it's got to be perfect. 
When I look at this, there are still systematic residuals going on. So something is still wrong with this pattern. And uh, while this recent work is, I think, very encouraging, I don't think it's the final word. Let me just give you a feeling for what's going to probably be the last ingredient that we have to add before we can say we're done. And that is the last refuge of the astrophysical scoundrel. It's the magnetic field. As you all know, when you get stuck with modeling things, you say, it's magnetic field. Uh, here, I think it's magnetic fields. Let me, let me give you some reason why I think this is true. Well, first of all, if you remember those spectra of the objects, they were relatively normal. Now, when you heat something, coronally heat something, you're going to get emission lines, right? That's not what we see. We see photospheres that look quite quiescent. To me, that tells me the energy is being deposited very deep. And so the heating is well sub-photosphere, and it's being thermalized fairly before you see the optical emission. That tells me it's very high-energy particles, possibly super high-energy gamma rays, but almost certainly very high-energy particles. There's another piece of information I think that's pretty interesting, and that is, let's think about what's going on here. These objects, these black widows and red backs, when you look at the backside, they're dark, but in particular for the black widows, which are substellar objects, they're not invisible. It turns out that there is energy transport from the hot side to the cold side. And some sort of deep convective mixing is actually carrying some of that heating energy around the backside. Those of you who do, I don't know if we have any exoplanet people, but some of the, um, the hot Jupiter issues, I think, are closely being mirrored by these objects here. So we got convection. And of course we have rotation, don't we? Because these are short period systems that are tidally locked. By definition, every companion here is a rapidly rotating star. Convection plus rotation equals magnetic fields. There you go. That's a theorist for you. Um, now, OK, observationally, let's say it's not, there's actually direct evidence as well. Let me show you once again our favorite object of this Titterin class, is this uh, 1311. We got lucky during one of our Keck campaigns, and we caught it during a sequence of three um, five-minute spectra, where it went from this phase, here we go, this, this light spectrum here, up to this spectrum and back down to that one. It underwent a really dramatic flare. If you calculate what's going on in this over this 15-minute period, you can actually show, here's the different spectrum, which, by the way, is really remarkable. I don't know how many of our optical spectroscopists but I was very surprised to see this line. Anybody see helium-2, 6560? It's not something you commonly see, because it's right on H-alpha. And any time you've got any hydrogen around, it's going to totally wipe it out. But, but in this case, we have so little hydrogen in the system that this heated surface of the companion, heated up to a fact to about 40,000 degrees on the flare patch, is emitting strong helium-2 absorption lines. Pretty, pretty rare. In any case, the energy required to, over a period of 15 minutes to flare it up like that and drop it back down is large. It could only be plausibly produced by a subsurface magnetic field that's releasing in an eruptive flare. So here's the cartoon. Now, at this point, I don't have any calculations for you. This is the end game of the talk, and I think this is what we're going to have to work on next. And that is that somehow this surface, this magnetic field on the companion, is probably redirecting the high-energy particles produced in this in interbinary shock and ducting them down to the surface. Now, there's a plus to this. If you think about that, the sail area of that magnetic field is large. It can take a large fraction of the particles being produced by the shock and bring them down, helping heat the surface. But there's a minus to that. And that is one of the great challenges here is that I think it's going to be very difficult to predict with high accuracy the dipolar or multipolar structure of these magnetic fields. So the exact heating positions on the surface may be very difficult to calculate. And I'm worried about that, frankly. So I think this is where I want to kind of wrap up the talk by saying, these are exotic, interesting objects. There's an important possibility that they remain the most extreme black widows, uh, the most extreme neutron stars that we know of. And so by carefully measuring their masses, we have a chance to really constrain fundamental physics, the equation of state and QCD at high densities. But the task to doing that has led us through a morass of astrophysical detail that our particle physics colleagues would just turn their nose up at. But we as astrophysicists know you sometimes have to understand this stuff to get to the deeply important answers. It's turned out to be worse than I originally hoped. There's more detail than is relevant than I had originally anticipated. But we're making progress. And with modern observations, I think we have a good chance of locking down the systematics and really making precision measurements. Why is it important again? Let's look at this classical diagram, the radius of a neutron star versus its mass. I talked about the double neutron star systems. Here they are. They clearly clock in at 1.4 or so solar masses. The wide, white dwarfless neutron star systems are here. Here are the, I can read off the telephone number. Well, don't bother. There's, these are the two most massive systems um, known about at present, and they're just under two solar masses. Here's the open question. These black widows and tids that I'm describing, the formal measurements are up here around 2.5 or higher. 
I think once you do all the corrections, they're going to probably clock in at 2.2 or so. But it's pretty important because depending on whether it's 2.2 or 2.7, very different possibilities for the equation of state are going to be excluded. Well, I thought I would leave you with one more kind of funnish thing to think about. It's, um, we've talked about all this mass being pushed across in the neutron star. We talked about the idea that there's some maximum mass for a neutron star. Uh, what's to guarantee that a black widow will actually stop in time? What's to prevent it from overdoing and pushing across enough matter during the accretion phase that it never actually turns into a millisecond pulsar? Well, I don't think there's really anything. I mean, here, look at the distribution of masses of compact objects from this particular reference in uh, close binaries. There's a bunch of stuff at the neutron star distribution, and here's the tail of black widows. I suppose nowadays we should certainly include an, one point out here, for two points out here, for the uh, gravity wave signal that was just found uh, recently. It, it is at least possible for a binary, for a black hole in a binary to have a mass of 20 plus solar masses. But most of them seem to be in this domain here around 10-ish solar masses. But there's a gap, and that gap's important. The upper boundary of that gap is, as we've just been arguing, not super well determined. But if you're shoving matter across to a neutron star, who's to, you know, when you're in an X-ray binary, who's to say whether that thing is a neutron star or a black hole? There's no reason to stop. What if you overdo it and you push yourself across that, into that gap and become a black hole? I think, unfortunately, the story may be very hard to chase down. Let's face it, when you had a black widow, it's the spin energy of that pulsar which is illuminating the companion and making it possible to see the darn thing. You turn that into a black hole, you're going to end up with a planetary mass companion in a close orbit around a black hole. This is not visually exciting. If you look at the cooling rates of such objects, you know, in 100 mega years, it's gone. You're never going to see the companion object directly. Well, almost. Let's not forget GR. Gravitational radiation will take such systems and bring them closer. And it turns out it's not hopeless. If you're about two and a half solar masses and a hundredth solar mass companion, it's about a Hubble time to bring them in together. What would be a brilliant conclusion of this kind of scenario if you found a low mass black hole system with a super low mass companion? So a black hole with not five-ish or more solar masses, which, as Jeff can tell you, most of the black holes seem to have, but something that clocks in at 2.6 or 2.7 solar masses. Heavier than a neutron star, definitely a black hole, but not up at the classical direct regime. So that's my conclusion. I think I've told you about this exotic class of objects, and I've convinced you that it really is the product of Fermi's power at localizing the directions to these crazy gamma ray sources. I told you that there's a, a lot of interesting physics, and I think that these new class of objects, these titterins discovered by Fermi, are particularly interesting with the helium companions and the tight, ultra-tight orbits, record-tight orbits, and that these objects have the potential for deeply impacting a range of astrophysics and physics. That potential has, alas, not been fully realized. I expect it to be done by 2016, but it looks like it's going to be a few more years before we really have the models in adequate shape to answer. That's what I had to say, and so I'm done. Any likes? Questions? Yeah. Well, as I say, I think one of the best distinguishing characteristics is how much mass you've managed to push across. So when we're doing this, these mass measurements here, part of the quest is the, is the frontier physics, trying to get the maximum mass. Just, you know, it's bragging rights. But it's also important to do accurate measurements for as many as you can, because exactly the reason you referred to, you can tell what path they took if you figure out how much mass had been transferred. And so I think that's the best way of, of ruling out the paths. But I, I forget who first said this, but I mean, anything not forbidden is mandatory. So the physical processes that occur there, if they can lead to all these paths, they probably will. It then becomes a question of how common they are. Scenario machines that calculate binary evolution are, are notoriously difficult to make reliable, but it's still an effort that one can try to do. You can try to calculate the relative numbers. Personally, I believe the relatively simple paths will probably dominate, but that remains to be tested exactly in the way you're proposing, trying to do the measurements. Structure of that neutron star to look like? Will the accreting material actually condense and 
down onto the crust, or will it be an atmosphere? Or well, I mean, there always will be some small atmosphere, but the, you know, the overburden of the stuff you lay on just pushes it down through neutron drip and on down into the core. You will be actually, the, the stuff that you accreted will be a large fraction of the material actually occupying the envelope, and the original neutron star will be compressed down to be that core. Um, you know, I, I, I did not know the structure of neutron stars in detail because I don't know the equation of state, but there is only one equation of state. I don't know what it is, and no more than one of the ones drawn in there could be right at most, um, but there is only one equation of state. And once you accrete onto it, I think that the neutron stars are completely determined by that mass. Sure, rotation can support a little bit of extra M, but I, I think the accreted stuff is just a conventional but heavy neutron star. That'd be my belief. What do you think the prospects are for studying how a relativistic jet impact um, affects the gas like this in a real experimental way? Because I'd love to know that from mm. Yeah, I know. Um, so that's, that's a, actually an interesting question here. Um, when we do these calculations, we actually treat the material as coming off as a, as a uniform plasma, but it, there's a latitudinal distribution. It's actually sine squared theta. Um, we also do cosine squared theta calculations, but it's not really a jet per se. We believe that the pulsar wind, uh, the most of the power from it probably in these cases turns out to be this striped wind that's coming off of the neutron star. And that while there is a latitudinal dependence, there, it's not as if the pole itself makes a jet. Now, sometimes they do. We know of pulsar wind nebula. Chandra has done a brilliant job at observing some of these. Pat and others have, where you can actually see these narrow jets of collimated plasma. Those seem to be coming out along the rotational axis. And so in those cases, I believe it's probably hoop stress in the twisted B field that's collimating a flow there. Those may be an, a plausible paradigm for doing the kind of tests you're describing. I'm not so sure these binaries are. Remember, the scale that we're working out here is very small compared to the PWN scale. And I think that the wind primarily is going to be this equatorial striped wind flow. I don't expect tightly collimated emission in most cases. You know, it's true that the movie that was made there seemed to give you the impression that you've got this laser beam of gamma rays coming out, sweeping by and blasting the star periodically. Ah. <sighs> Well, if only it were so, <laughs> that would be sexy. In fact, it was, it was so cool, I actually tried one experiment, which I didn't tell you about here. It's a, we did this at SALT, of taking rapid photometry of the nose of some of these objects and seeing if we could see the, re, the, the reverberation or reflection of the, of the gamma rays and optical heating. Um, but I think in practice, it's really mostly the striped wind instead of a collimated beam. But man, that would be sweet if that were true. <laughs> Yeah. One of our old problems. Yeah, something dear to my heart. From, and, you know, my understanding of this hasn't developed much since the early 90s when I worked on it. So, I mean, there are... We didn't know about these super long time. We didn't. Guys. Yeah. Are their fields weaker? Well, they're, they're low field millisecond pulsars, but they're not, they're not noticeably weaker than the others. And I think the way I think about this is that it's kind of a logarithmic process. Getting the field down by that first factor of 10 only takes a few thousandths of a solar mass. Next factor of 10, a few hundredths, a few tenths for that last bit. But the difference between one tenth and, you know, six tenths is not a very big difference. It seems like the field probably asymptotes. At least observationally, that seems to be the case. But I hesitate to say that very strongly because I don't think this process of burying the magnetic field or otherwise decre decreasing it, which must happen in this recycling, is fully understood. So if there was a systematic difference, uh, that would be really interesting. I haven't noticed that. You know, it's not like the titterins are all at 10 to the 7th Gauss and everything else is 10 to the 8th. By the way, all is only three objects so far, so. <laughs> In your, your um, um, period flux diagram where you were showing the, the traces as, as time goes through, uh, you originally argued that well, we're not seeing anything up here because they would merge inside of Hubble time. But obviously, you now have some of them sort of diving through that region. Awesome. Is that because they're moving too fast to see, or because they're um, to make it out? Th this, is an, this is an excellent question for an X-ray astronomer, because, of course, they are visible. They're X-ray binaries, right? We do know of ultra-compact X-ray binaries. Those, that red phase there was accretion-powered during those red phases where they, they dove behind the envelope. And during that region there, there are X-ray binaries. Can you go back there? Sure. Yeah. There are not many such things, but they exist. Uh, I probably should have gone to the selector, but 
We'll find one version of this diagram at some point. There was a lot of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, I covered a lot of stuff, didn't I? <laughs> All right, here you go. So, I mean, these are kind of schematic. You don't, don't get me wrong. I don't say the corner is exactly there. But, I mean, this process of coming down the main sequence and turning on the degenerate branch does pull you deep into this really short period regime. And so it should be X-ray binaries through that phase. Relatively low M dot X-ray binaries, but X-ray binaries nonetheless. Uh, this, is a, this is a Hubble time, actually, coming all the way down here. It's, it takes a long time. In fact, this particular model is a bit slow. The tick marks are giga years. So this particular one might not have quite have made it. So can you, so can you then predict the population, given this population, you predict that population? You should, and I'm not, I, have, I have proposed to do so, but that particular grant was not funded, so I haven't done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's a great question. You know, it's, that's... This scenario is certainly falsifiable if it predicts an excess number of X-ray binaries that would be visible in standard surveys. So it's something definitely to pay attention to. Yeah. Well, you do. Sure. I mean, we do know of ultra-compact X-ray binaries. The numbers are not large, but. Don't forget that once they break out and break free, these, the spin-powered neutron stars can last forever. Their spin-down rates are much longer than the Hubble time. So once you make them, they're there forever. So, so do we know names of people in here? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. So is in here? No. No, no. No, these are the guys that are down at, you know, yeah, the, these are like 20-minute to 14-minute orbital periods. These are the really short guys. They're the degenerate, helium-dominated companions. Any last questions about spiders? <laughs> <laughs> now you may retreat in fear. <laughs> it, it's a bit of a, uh, um, more of a comment than a question, but um, lately I've been uh, worrying about population of X-ray binaries in a Stefan galaxy. And so I was wondering how this would uh, relate to the uh, formation of that big sequence. In particular, your mass X-ray binaries, as you know, they can be formed in, uh, in, po in uh, Gobra clusters. And yeah, yeah. This stuff clearly would fall into that, but not necessarily. Oh, no, absolutely. That's a great question. Right, but the other thing Comment. is that <laughs> when we look at the uh, X-ray luminosity function mm -hmm. of these things with Chandra, there is a typical break Defining the neutron star population, separating that from the black hole population we find. This break is not uh, at 1.6, etc., but it's more like 2. Point something hmm. in terms of uh, edmonton masses, uh, edmonton of luminosity can form masses in an infrared edmonton accretion. So, uh, um, I mean, I was wondering if uh, some of these low mass X ray binaries we see maybe come from these guys. It's possible. Um, I think, as I suggested, that if, if the argument is that you're going to grow the neutron star up from 1.4 or, as sometimes proposed, about 1.7 initial solar masses, you've, you've got to bring a lot across. I mean, we certainly know the minimum, so no observation, the minimum mass is bigger than 2. So at least several tenths of a solar mass must be transferred. And uh, that alone requires a relatively long, relatively low m dot evolution. Some binaries do undergo that sort of evolution. I would not be terrifically surprised um, if you had some 1.7ers brought up to 1.2.3 to or 2.4 and became black holes. I think that that would be, and those would not have to be titterans. I think you might be able to do that with a black widow. But it would still be a very low mass secondary, I think, just to keep the evolution long enough so the M dots are not too high. Um, just if I may make a quick response, the common number of globular clusters is great. I mean, of course, after that first two were f of these black widows were found in the galactic disk, the only place we found them for quite a while was globular clusters. The recycling, the exchange of neutron stars into short period binaries is a wonderful way of introducing lots of relatively short period systems and getting them started down this, this black widow path. Um, observationally, the challenge is the clusters are diff distant and crowded. And so this kind of detailed metrology that I was trying to convince you is really essential to do the physics, I think is only possible for these new systems that we found in the disk, and in fact, many of them at distances within a KPC or so. So remember that they're intrinsically very low luminosity. And so you need that kind of proximity to do these high precision measurements that I'm describing.
The clusters are certainly important for the population and the overall evolution, but they're probably not the place where we can play this precision science game. No more questions? Let's thank Roger. Thanks. <laughs> okay. What? Sorry? The discussion of the spiders. That was yeah, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Some people hate those names, but, you know, you do what you can. Great talk, Roger. Thanks. Good to see you. Yeah. We're going to get together at 2.30, I think, right? Today? Yeah, great. Yep. I'll come. Yep. That's shortly, right. so yep. I'll yep. wander over your place. Yeah, Let's see. Pat right after or something. I, mean, schedule, I, um, I should I should write that down. Yeah. I also need to get some room numbers written down because yeah. I don't remember exactly where everybody is. Fourth, fourth floor of B, and I'm down at the end. Pat's right next door to me. Oh, right, right. So you're the other end of the hall. Right. Okay, okay so I just go down the corridor. Yeah. See you there shortly. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That was, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, um, I was going to ask you about this diagram. It's a totally different question. Yeah. Is that a real gap or is that an observational gap? You had, you had evolutionary paths that looked very well occupied mm. down there. But yeah, well, one thing to, to recognize, I'm plotting here the minimum mass, and so inclination takes these things and spreads them So I don't think it's a true gap. But, I'll, but why remember evolutionarily. Why would that be? Evolution. Wouldn't, wouldn't the correct